is the concept of rhythmatism. And rhythmatism is the study of the patterns that weave the fabric of life. If you know the beat of life, then you can... If, if you know where the yeah. beat is going to land, you, you can, can jump, jump on, on it. it. There you are. Here's something um, remarkably interesting for you. Now, this is a recording studio. You can probably tell that by the thickness of the door. And this is deepest England, as opposed to darkest Africa, which I'll explain about in a moment. Now, I've come out here to Stuart Copeland's house. Now, Stuart Copeland, you know, from the police, when he's been out and about, travelling all around the world, doing things like soundtracks and making movies and experimenting with African music and the like. Well, I've got to talk to him in a minute and find out all about that. Now, you do realise, consequently, that this is his kit. The kit. Now, I know I shouldn't play it, but I've got a couple of minutes before I get a chance to talk to him about Africa and everything, so maybe I could sort of... Um, <coughs> Up till now, you've been a relatively straightforward drummer, songwriter, trying a bit of the old film scores and the like, and suddenly you're rocking it away off to Africa to come back with something which became known as the Rhythmatist. Explain a little why you suddenly decided to go to Africa of all places. Well, Africa of all places, Africa is surely one of the most exciting places to go. I mean, doesn't everyone want to go there? Lions, tigers, Watusis. It's a very exciting place. And for the kind of film that I was trying to make, which is a video cassette kind of film, uh, I needed a very interesting subject that didn't require a lot of explanation. Because I was making a, um, or rather I made now, a uh, video LP, an LP for your eyes. Which means it's a film, but it doesn't rely on a story. Uh, because once you've seen a story once, you don't want to see it again and again. And I want it to be a, something that you can play again and again. And, um, I, didn't, I wasn't really interested in making a documentary, so I had to find a subject that was just fascinating to look at, where I could just hose the place down and get millions of pictures and uh, put music to them instead of information or story. As a drummer, was it the rhythms of Africa which sort of drew you there, or was it the, uh, was it, you know, the grand scenery? Or? Um, well, obviously the, the, the rhythms are the main thing, but once I got there, they just turned out to be a small part of the incredibleness of Africa. I mean, that's the, the animals, the tribes, the culture and everything. There's just so much stuff going on there. Um, sure, there's plenty of rhythm too, though. Did you have a clear cut idea on what you were going to do when you went out there and you were going to come back with this? I had a concept. A very clear concept, which was written on a scruffy piece of paper, which I lost after about two days shooting. Um, as far as the actual shots we got, um, we were pretty much thinking on our feet. Uh, the director and I, Jean-Pierre Dutio, would go out ahead and uh, find our locations and our tribes and find out what was going on. Uh, you know, if there was a, a, any kind of ritual happening, a rain dance or a circumcision or any of these fascinating ceremonies that they all have. Um, we'd go and, and film it, and or we'd, we'd find out where they're going, introduce ourselves to the tribe, you know, make friends and stuff, and then we'd bring in the crew and shoot it. So we pretty much um, plotted our course as we went along, but the concept we had before we went, and the concept is the concept of rhythmatism, and rhythmatism is the study of the patterns that weave the fabric of life. If you know the beat of life, then you can... It, if you know where the yeah. beat is going to land, you, you can, can jump, jump on, on it. it.
So rhythmism actually exists? It, it's a real... Well, I mean, it started out as a frivolous concept. I mean, here am I, you know, getting all this incredible reward from society for this obscure talent that I have for banging things in rhythm. Um, there must be something important to it, I figured. Um, and so I went out, so I've, I've been thinking about this for years, you know, and I've evolved a whole philosophy based on rhythmism. And it turns out that there are now Germans with unpronounceable names, you know, philosophers teaching this stuff in university and stuff. It turns out to be a real serious subject. And I thought I made it up. Africa, uh, you had problems filming when you were over there, all kinds of lunatic stuff. Well, well I, I didn't have so much problems as adventures, uh, there, of which there are quite a few. Um, we had to get permits, which was a whole, which wasn't a very exciting adventure of trading the offices of the bureaucrats. You know, in these these places where the tribes are way out there in the wilderness, um, all of the land in Africa that's all parcelled off into nations, and in these nations there are ministries of culture and stuff like that. And to film these tribesmen who've never even heard of this nation that has erected itself around them, you have to go into the nearest big city and get a permit from the minister of this or the ministry of that. Uh, which was, was a hassle. Um, there were some times when the hassle actually went beyond hassle, like when they threw us in jail. Um, what was that all about? What happened there? Oh, that wasn't, well, it wasn't anything really that dramatic. It was um, going from Zaire to the Congo. Uh, we crossed Zaire, okay. We were in Bujumbura, which I'm sure you've heard of. I mean, everyone knows Bujumbura. Um, oh, but they, yeah, but they didn't have a Congolese embassy, which is where we wanted to go. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had to just kind of take potluck and show up at the border. And we crossed Zaire to get to the Congo, and we crossed the Congo River from Kinshasa. And uh, they wouldn't let us in, so they sent us back across the river. When we got back to Zaire, instead of being in transit, we were in persona non grata. We were like refused, and obviously either terrorists, CIA agents, or something like that. Um, and so they threw us in the coolie. Uh, until they could think about what to do with us, which took them about 24 hours. And uh, thankfully their decision was to let us go. So they let us go. The most exotic place, I suppose, was um, the Congo. We went up the Congo River, uh, way up until the point where it isn't the Congo River anymore, and often the branches um, up the Oeso River. And way up there is the heart of pygmy country, and we found pygmies there. And uh, we went deeper and deeper into the jungle and found pygmies, finally, who had never uh, even heard of white people. Actually, they had heard um, that there were there's a big world out there. But never you know, had first-hand experience. But they never, they'd never met anybody. They had no t-shirts. They had no beers. T-shirts, incidentally, are the first vestige of uh, civilization, so-called, to that, make it into the jungle. Is that a currency over there? It's, in a way, yeah. I mean, it, we got further and further out and um, deeper and deeper into the jungle. And uh, gradually, as all the accoutrements of civilization fell away behind us, the last vestige to disappear was the t-shirt <laughs> and beer. And beer. Beer and makes beer. its way in there. Yeah. So. The, one of the final stages before we left it all behind, the, um, you know, the pygmies who have had some contact were wearing t-shirts and drinking beer but still hunting with their poison darts and everything. And eventually went deeper in. They took us into their, their cousins who, who didn't even have t-shirts and beer. It's, people think of like pygmies as like one race over there, one tribe, one small group of people. That's well, it, it is. It, it branches. Uh, they, there are lots of different tribes, but it is, it is a, you could describe it as a different race, I think. They're, they have different kind of facial characteristics, different bone structure from the Bantu, who are, who are the other tribe there, who are taller, uh, darker skinned and have slightly different, you know, they, they, they definitely look different. Uh, a lot of it's not right. I mean, they, they, they file their teeth as well. Their teeth are like saws. They're pretty, they're pretty uh, interesting people. How do they react to the giant blonde? We were probably the biggest, ugliest, whitest things they'd ever seen in their lives. Um, but they're very, they're very furtive, very timid. And getting in to meet them was hard. We, you know, we went through a lot of deserted villages where we'd be walking down the jungle trail, and we'd we'd hear the sounds of uh, stuff, or you know, or we'd know that there was a village there. We'd go, and it would be deserted, and we'd know that they were in the trees watching, uh, to, you know, to see what we did. And we didn't do anything. We'd sit around for a while, and we'd we'd um, wait for them to come out, and they wouldn't, so we'd we'd move on. You took local guides. Uh, well, we had several, because the Bantu are hated by the pygmies and vice versa, kind of. They don't get along very well. Um, but the Bantu are the one who could speak. You see, 
the interpreting situation was about four, a four-way thing, where we'd have um, a person from the town who could speak um, uh, a little bit of French and a little bit of Lingala. Lingala is like the, um, the pidgin French, which the different tribes used to speak to each other. And so we'd have somebody who could speak a bit of French and a bit of Lingala. And the, and the Lingala would get us through to the Bantu. And the Bantu guy would, would be able to speak a little bit of, like, some of the pygmy dialects of the ones that we, were, were near to the civilization. Mm. And those would take us into, into the jungle. And so we'd have, like, four people to have to talk through. You know, like an animal runs across our, our view of some exotic animal. So what's that? And, you know, it goes down to the next guy. What's that? And it goes to the next guy. What's that? What's that? What's that? It comes back all the way back. Food. <laughs> My hosts seem to take for granted my ingestion of their native weed. Fortunately, my college education in California has prepared me for this trial. of their music. There's a hole where my head was. to it. They're used to the fact that they're separated either by huge distances or by impenetrable jungle. Uh, and they're quite used to communicating through with, without the use of language. Were they pleased to see you? Uh, yeah, they were. They, it, was, it was something new for them. I mean, they were fascinated. They all gathered around and watched everything we did, and we let them look through the cameras and stuff. And The things they enjoyed most of all were like Polaroid. I had a Polaroid camera. They take a picture of a group of them. And they, they all look, and they see this picture materialized in front of their eyes and they look and they say hey look there's the chief and now oh, there's my wife and there's there's my kids and hey who's that guy <laughs> and for every one of them they'd look at this picture and they'd recognize everybody in there but there'd be one complete stranger which of course was themselves because they don't have any mirrors they have no idea what they look yeah like. which was amazing I mean, they'd be, you could see them looking at this and then they'd, they'd look at one guy there and they'd say well, who's that and that would be themselves i mean these people are not even iron age they're uh, not even Stone Age, really, because there are, there are no real hard rocks in the jungle. The, the hardest substance in this part of the jungle is wood. I mean, the rocks, it's just kind of clay. There's no real hard rocks. Is that because it's rainforest? Or really yeah, rainforest? it's very mushy. And everything they make out of is... is um, they're even, they have an even more expendable society than we do. They make a crossbow. They shoot a few times. It falls apart. They make another one. They just pull another few strips off a tree, whip it together in seconds. And they're and they're equipped again. How do you feel about going into like really remote, not even Iron Age parts, like you said there, sort of taking 20th century technology and uh, something fundamentally wrong? I felt wrong about like it. the first germ of pollution. As a matter of fact, this is another deep philosophical problem we had uh, when we left. They were giving us presents and stuff, which is what they do, and we obviously we felt we had to give them presents back. But we, you know, the presents that we had to give them back were like plastic containers, our ground sheet and things which are useful but in a way are pollution mm. and the horrible thing is that they gravitate towards this kind of pollution um, they in their own environment are the lords of their environment they're in complete control they're, they have the, the you know they're, they're lords of the jungle but the minute they see somebody wearing a t-shirt they want a t-shirt and they gravitate towards the, the, um, the town where they go from being lord of their environment to being on the bottom, bottom rung of our civilization, on the very outskirts of it. But they, 
go from the top of their own pile to the bottom of this pile. I'm an ethno music buff, and it, um, I don't actually, you know, like I didn't go to Africa to learn new forms of the paradiddle. Mm. Uh, I didn't find any new forms of the paradiddle, but just the atmosphere, the ambience, the, the, um, the style of it has kind of gotten under my skin and will be coming out. Was it difficult to sort of bring all that back, to actually transfer it? to sort of recreate the, what you experienced over there, back over there? Ah, well, for this, I have my machines. I did several kinds of uh, recording there. The main kind was with a tape machine. I recorded uh, these songs. Only, um, you know, um, here we, in, 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 in uh, the modern world, we have our 12-minute dance mixes. But in Africa, they have the, the six-hour dance mix. Uh, one of their songs will last for, like, all day. It builds up and it, with the children banging on drums, and then the, the grown-ups get involved. <coughs> and it gets heavier and heavier and heavier and builds up and builds up and builds up and whatever it is they're celebrating. Um, you know, the whole thing just builds up in intensity, but it takes years. So I have a six-hour recording of, of a piece of music. The other way is to record a one or two second, what's called a sample. And this one second sample, which will be one voice or one drum or one plucked note on an instrument, um, is called a sample. And I feed these samples into my computer this guy here. Right. Show me. And uh, here, let me load where this you, Where guy. do you store your samples, man? So like samples two seconds are stored there. Which is a computer disk. Which is a computer disk. All right. I'll stick the computer disk in the computer. This is a musical computer. This is a Paralyte musical computer. Mm -hmm. And I load it up. And did you have to relearn techniques? to sort of be able to adopt to use all this sort of thing. Yeah, well, the main thing I had to learn how to do is put the discs in correctly. That's the wrong way around, I see. Yeah. There we go, okay. There we are. It starts printing up everything you recorded on there, or an explanation Well, what it, it does is I've, I've loaded them in there now. And, uh, for instance, this here, this is a, um, a tin can recorded on the east coast of Africa. <laughs> Uh, they sound played, different there. Played, played by the Jiriyama tribe. And you see, I have a sample, which is that. Mm -hmm. But I can play it anywhere on the keyboard. And it moves it up and down the scale of music. Yeah. Um, here's another one, which is, which is a similar sort of thing. But here's some voices. Those are human voices? These are human voices. These are actually Maasai tribesmen. That's that not I'm actually recording. a recording, though, is it? Well, it's a recording of that much. Well, I actually have a recording of six hours of music, and I just cut off like one second of it, which is one, and I can play a melody on it, you know. You know. But it's, it's actually recreating it. It's a digital recreation of uh, the original sample as opposed to that's, a recording of it. Yeah, that's right. And then I can... Yes. Double bass uh, from the uh, from the uh, tribe of London session musicians. Quite a different tribe, that isn't it? I can have him. I can put in a note there. Yeah, I've just put in that note. Mm -hmm. So when I tell it to play, well, the, the other stage this thing does is you'll notice a number there. That's pattern number 22. And I can write any number of patterns. And so if I just tell it to play this bar, this is one bar, right. four beats in a bar, and that's a bar and I place these notes in it. That's actually musical notation. These are, mu these are musical notes. Yeah. And I tell it that I want it to play, you know, when it goes one, two, plays that note there, and that note there, and so on. So if I say play 22. So in order to do this, you actually have to be a musician. That's one bar playing over again. One, yeah. two, three, four, three. That we have a 
drum box going as well. This, this is another form of sampling, which is modern drums. This is a uh, standard dancer rhythmic uh, drum box. I've heard on most dance records yeah, in one way or another. Play A. See, that's pattern one, followed by pattern two. Mm -hmm. And that's pattern three. They're not changing that much either. But you stop a second. What you've, you've, you've actually done is create something new. You changed yeah, here, quite dramatically from the original noises. Oh yeah, well I've just added them all up into a, uh, I've melted them together, like, you know, like eggs are not very similar to the form of egg you would see when it shows up in a cake. I see. Uh, <laughs> there, are, there are those who criticize uh, sort of electronic music, like the Fairlight and everything, has been uh, not creative. You've got you must be joking. They say that it's, it's electronic, it's synthetic, there's no feel to well, it. Well, I mean, a guitar is a synthetic uh, creation of a sound wave in the same way that a, the uh, synthesizer is. Mm. I mean, it's, that's, that's rubbish. That's people with bright colored socks arguing in bistros, you know. It's rubbish. Anything that makes a, anything that makes a sound is an instrument of one kind or another, whether it's um, high technology that creates a sound or low technology that creates the sound is irrelevant. It's the tune and the, the imagination that goes into it that's important. It's clear that you need to be more of a musician in order to do this and merely a computer operator is what well, a lot of people seem to think. Well, this computer, I mean, I would never have been able to design or build this program. Um, and it's made so that you don't really have to know that much about computers to run it. And I certainly don't know anything about computers. I know how to operate this one. OK, this guy here is um, synchronizing the computer and the drum box. This mm. drum box is your average drum box. Right. Uh, so if I say go, what we're hearing is, is the drum box. Right. Which is synchronized to this guy. And this is something I've written before, you know. So this just enables you to play along to the drum machine with this? Yeah. And, then, and I've already written that. Right. So this is down here, and there's the double bass. So right. I'll write a pattern on there, you know. All right, and I'll put it into record. See, it's playing that back. Mm -hmm. And then uh, let's, let's go up here and get this guy. And these are again using the voices that you brought back from Africa. I've written that guy and he'll play along quite happily. Okay. Let's, uh, let's write some woes in, shall we? Wait a minute, I turned him off. Hang on. Let's get going again here. Okay, off he goes. play it on the right note so it's in tune and in right time. <laughs> you took a single from the rhythmist, Cotejo, Cotea? Cotejo, it's not Cote Spanish, it's Cotejo, Cote Cote Zairean. Right. The story behind that? Well, it's actually a traditional song. Um, it's, the Cotejo is a dance, and it's a dance of purification. And to do, do this dance, you have to take off all of your clothes, take off all your personality, and start from scratch. And it's an allegory of Zairean society, um, which needs to cleanse itself from within. And it's a song from the banks of the Congo River, which was found um, by Ray Lema, who sings the song. You know, there's, there's uh, talking about the morality of it, you know, like taking an in a musician's performance and taking one note of that performance, a recording of it, and then using it like this it's a, it's a point that the law hasn't gotten into yet, but I'm sure will very soon. Um, people, people like Peter Gabriel, or, uh, who, 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 or people who make a lot of really good sounds, he's noticed sounds that he's recorded showing up on other people's recordings. Um, I personally haven't actually sampled anybody else's record. 
uh, to get like a, a brass hit. It's sort of like scratch, you know, where they, uh -huh. they get it one brass, a moment they get a moment, yeah. yeah. Um, I personally have been sampled though. Yeah, he was I've been reading, um, you know, like the, the drummer with uh, Bruce Springsteen uh, has, has taken like Every Breath You Take. There's a big snare drum hit at the beginning of it. They've taken that and they use that sampled snare drum on, on a few of their records. Have they processed it and changed it around and, and so on, so I can't really, but, but How it, it you feel started about out that? as my snare drum hit yeah. on, on those records. Isn't using other people's performance like that one moment in time like uh, an African singing or a, a session musician's particular note on the cello isn't that a sort of exploitation if you're using their artwork it's no different really uh, from recording six hours of their music and using that uh, the sound you know recording one second and doing whatever I want to it is really no different from recording six hours and and doing whatever I want to mm. it. the important thing for me is the result the cross-pollination the fact that that um, I can use elements from anywhere. I'm not even going to stop for a minute to think about the morality of stealing somebody's music or anything, because as far as I know, when I've recorded their music and left their village, it's not like they all look around and say, hey, where's our music gone? It's like vanished, stolen by those, those guys who came in and re recorded it and took it away. It's still there when we've left. Mm. Um, as far as the, their attitude towards <clears throat> any kind of recording of their music and its use elsewhere, the main way that we were able to make friends with them and the main thing that they liked was when we explained to them that we want to record their music and show it to cultures outside of Africa and that we're going to, out of all the tribes of Africa, we've selected them to represent their culture and as an example of what they do. And they were amazed that we'd be interested in it for a start. And, and they loved the fact that it would be recorded. They listened back to our recordings and they loved the, the recording of it. And the idea that people across across the waters, so to speak, would, would hear their music was a real charge for them. Nothing could have made them feel better than that. And the idea of, like, theft of their music is something that, that they just wouldn't have even begun to... Uh, if we'd tried to explain it to them, they wouldn't have understood it. Um, as a far as... Royalty is not due to them. Uh, as far as um, royalties and so on, for a start, this is like an arty project that will not generate a great deal of royalties. Um, it's not going to make my fortune. But even if it did, I've apportioned, I think, a third of it because, at the end of the day, on, on the album, there is a, a, about a third of it is African sounds, and about two thirds of it is sounds that you know I created myself. The interesting thing is to take all these different elements and put them together. That's what art is all about. It doesn't matter where it came from. It matters if it works, if it's interesting, mm. if it enriches the, the culture that we have. The most important thing to me is cross-pollination. Um, you can follow a path, like if you're a blues guitarist and all you want to play is blues, that's one thing, and you're, you're just limited to that world. If it, ha if it isn't a blues note, if it hasn't been played by Otis Redding, uh, then it isn't it just isn't part of your vocabulary. I don't. That's not. I have a certain amount of respect for that kind of musician, but that's not what I am. I'm a. I'm a mixer. I'll take blues and mix it with this and come up with new forms. Because that's 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 what turns me on to listen to, and that's what turns me on to create. And so that's what I do. Let's talk a bit more about Rumblefish, working with Francis Coppola. Yes, Rumblefish, the birth of rhythmatism. Mm. The way that all started was that he called me up and he said that he had this film in which time was a very important element and that he had written some, some melodies that he wanted me to help him with to um, exploit this concept of time, 
time running out for his characters. And he wanted to express this in rhythm. Rhythm in his shooting, you know, like pictures of clocks everywhere, and also in the music. Um, and as we got talking, I, I figured that there's this way of, um, of getting machine sounds, like a printing press. Clunch, clunch, clunch. With, um, you put that into a loop and um, synchronize that with another loop of a, of a pile driver. <laughs> and although they're in different rhythms, if you get, get them synchronized once, like every, like if this one's in a 3-4 time and that one's in a 4-4 four, four time, every 12 beats they'll land together. They'll land together. Uh -huh. um, and so even though rhythms that s seem disparate, in fact, they, they come together somewhere. And this is the birth of rhythmatism. The challenge is to make something that's original and exciting and so on that also connects with the masses. That's the challenge. It's easy, you know, like people talk about selling out and like going commercial as if that's the easy route. It isn't. That's the hard route. The easy route is to be entirely uh, spontaneously creative and, and totally indulgent. That's the easiest thing to do of all. But getting both of those sides together and connecting in both of those areas is, is the main challenge. Is, is it going to be followed through? Where to from here? Mm. Well, my big love in life, apart from playing in the band, um, is working with pictures. I really enjoy the combination of music and pictures. Very powerful combination. You can achieve great dramatic impact. I mean, you can really pull on the heartstrings with a, with a, an emotive picture and just two little notes, two little flutes weaving a gentle melody can really have emotional uh, impact, whereas without the picture, uh, you have to have everything going. You have to have the rhythm, the top line, the the, the, the chords, the lyric, and everything like that. And it's um, you, ha you achieve less with more stuff. And I really like the economy of working with a picture, and, and it's still just as powerful, it's still just as moving. But you can get that with much less. Do you find that more satisfying then, working with pictures as well? Um, well, it's a new world for me. I mean, my whole career up to now has been playing pop music, which is, in you know, in, in many respects, the highest art form. I mean, to be able to communicate something that's interesting and unique, but still understandable and meaningful to lots of people, as opposed to just a few intellectuals, um, is a real challenge. Do you draw from like your your previous works with? The police. And oh, the very much. I draw from everything I've done, and, and I bring into you know, like I've put into the police. Hopefully, you know, more than I've taken out. Will you be putting some of this into the police in one way or uh, another. One way or another, yeah. That's the whole point of all this is so that when we come back together again with the group, we've each had a chance to rub up against other talents and explore other avenues. So that when we come back together, we've got some new surprises for each other. Because after eight years of working with just there's only three of us after all. And eight years of working together, we've kind of like, in a way, used each other up. We, didn't, we, we still have the same kind of feeling about each other's talent, but we've, you know, I've kind of used up the current batch of Sting's bass lines and Andy's guitar riffs and my, my own drum patterns. And so each of us, we fanned out to go and find some new tricks to bring back into the band. Was there friction in the band when you went your separate ways to do this? No, not at all. There's, there's been friction down the years as in any band. Probably less, in fact, than most bands. We're just a lot more open about it, and people have watched us more closely. Um, we probably, I think, get along better than most groups do. Um, but at the time when we went our separate ways, our last gig was in Melbourne, Australia. And br band morale has, has rarely been higher than on the last tour we did together. It was a really good tour. It was a big tour. It was a big tour. Are you in a position to take two years off as a band now before, uh, well, since the last five gigs and released it, come back together? Well, the other thing is, is that it's a more of a challenge for the police. 
you know, to just carry on doing another album and riding it higher and higher um, is repetitive for us, for one thing, but also the challenge of having to go back and start again. Our, our next album isn't guaranteed. It's got to be good or else it will be forgotten. And so we're, we're up against more of a challenge with our next LP than we were for the last, say, two or three. You've been listening to Sting still? Yeah, it's very good, isn't it? You like that? Oh, yeah. But you like to have been involved in that, though? Uh, I mean, there are bits you were listening to... Bit... Sorry. You're listening to Sting, uh, say you're listening to his album and you heard like a drum pattern on there and you think, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. He should have done it this way. Do you find it frustrating? No, not at all. I, I, I appreciate that, that um, because he's such a good songwriter. I mean, I listened to his album once just out of, you know, curiosity, and I keep listening to it just for pleasure because it's a good record. Do you find uh, that you feel as if perhaps you almost you own Sting or you own part of each other? No. That's always been the, the basis of our relationship is that we don't own each other. Um, as he says, you know, if you love somebody, set them free. I don't have any ideas for rock videos, so I have no business making rock videos. The police videos um, are conceived, or the last few were conceived and directed and produced, and everything was done by, by um, Godly and Cream, uh, and we were very much in their hands. I just don't have anything to say in that form, so I'll won't say anything. I'll show up as a poser on the spot. Um, but that's all I have really to contribute. What do you think the police are going to come back like? There's two possibilities. One is we record in February and tour in August. And the other is we record in August and tour after that. What does that depend on? It depends on, well, I'm actually tied up through um, January. And I think Sting's working until mid-January as well. Andy's off in Japan at the moment, so who knows what, where he's going to be. Has he put the band together to tour? I'm not exactly sure. I haven't seen him for a while. I saw Sting just last week. Um, and we all know what he's up to. But Andy's been a very elusive for the last few months. He hiding something? He's hiding he down in Bournemouth or something. <laughs> or over in, in Japan. Are you tempted to tour? Or were you tempted to tour? I have been five? tempted to tour because that's the one thing that I really miss is touring. There's nothing that can beat that thrill of a big stage. You really miss it after the, the, the after synchronicity it, tour? It's just like well, I, I, I've always enjoyed touring. It's, there's just nothing that can beat that thrill of being on that stage with, with a band like that. I mean, it's a hot band. I mean, there's just no other band that gives me any kind of thrill like that. And there's only two of them as well. We can accomplish that much with two other guys. Usually it takes seven people. And um, I don't enjoy working with big bands as much as like just three people is the ultimate group for me. I've, I've seen quite a bit of Stuart and Andy. I saw Stuart last week in Los Angeles. And um, we're all having a great time. We're all having a ball, really. It's, uh, you know, we all lived in each other's pockets for seven years. And uh, we're having a holiday f from each other as much as anything else. Do you tend to sort of look at the projects that they're doing and weigh up exactly where they're going at the moment? Well, obviously, we're all interested in what each one of us does, you know, because uh, because the, those guys are like my brothers. I sort of I love them, and I, you know, I can't, you can't just walk out of their lives and never see them again. So we're obviously very interested in what each other do. Sort of beady eye, you know. <laughs> God, that's good. <laughs> what do you think of Stuart's project, for example? This African. I liked it. Film. I saw it the other day. I liked it very much. Very charming, and uh, the music was really good. Stuart uh, told us recently that he felt that 1986 would be the year for the police, that you would get back together and tour again. Do you know any more than that? I don't. I don't know, I don't know where he gets his information from. Really. <laughs> <laughs> this one's going to run and run, isn't it? Will the police ever get back together? Well, it's, it's a pretty good story, isn't it? Rumours abound all over the place concerning the police. Uh, things got quite out of True. hand. Uh, how, how does that happen? I don't know. I mean, we've been breaking up now for the last seven years, according to the newspapers. This is the only time it's ever been really taken seriously because we weren't physically together. Um, I mean, usually we're on the road somewhere and we hear that the you know the English tabloids have come out saying the police break up. It's official. And wait a minute, we're on the road together. We've got six more months of touring together, and where on earth do they get this story from? But this time we actually were separate. We weren't on the road. We, we hadn't made a record and so on, so I suppose the rumors were a little bit more believable. Does that make you feel important that, you know, people hang yeah, on Yeah, I was touched. I was touched that people, I mean, because they came out with this completely fabricated story for which they were taken to court and they had to own up that they had fabricated it and they re retracted it. 
let's make this absolutely clear. Um, we don't need to identify which tabloid it was, but they out, they completely fabricated a story out of thin air and attributed imaginary quotes to myself, which I never said anything like. Anyway, the response was very touching because the police hadn't been doing anything, and there you know other groups have risen to prominence and so on. And and um, I was amazed at the amount of concern that was shown over the fate of this group. I mean, I was concerned about the fate of the group because it's my group. But the, the, the fact that the world outside was so, um, so um, interested in it, it's very touching. It's nice that there's interest in you look, so that you've been splitting up for the last seven years. Yeah. Let's hope the interest keeps up so you're splitting up in the papers for the next well, seven years. Well, you know, worry about a splitting up is one thing, but whether or not, you know, the next piece of music we come up with is successful, that's another thing altogether. And it'll have to be good. That's the only criterion. It has to be incredible.